So why don't you tell me a little bit about yourself, Nick? Yeah. Oh, what should I call you, Nick Nicholas? It <clears throat> doesn't matter. Okay. <laughs> Nick Nick is probably easier. Okay. Um, yeah, so uh, um, that's tricky. Where do I start? I live in Santa Cruz. Oh, really? Not, yeah, I'm not too far from you. I'll, I'll be uh, trying to come to the uh, San Jose meetup here uh, in about a week. Oh, good. Um, I have a son who goes to UC Santa Cruz. Oh, really? Yeah. Nice. Yeah. It's a pretty town. It is. Definitely is. Expensive place to live, I bet. <laughs> it is. <laughs> a little uh, a little too much, I would I would say. Um, yeah, when yeah. my wife and I drive in there, it's like, oh, we should we should buy a house. And then we pull up Zillow and it's like Ooh. <laughs> like, maybe a shack. Maybe a shack. I'm gonna grab my water bottle here because I'm I'm fighting a cold and so it helps keep my keep my throat wet. Nice. So it went it just went around really bad around here a couple weeks ago. Okay. <clears throat> laid out most of the town. <laughs> it's a pretty laid out town to begin with. Yeah. <laughs> Any added stress is definitely uh, too much for Santa Cruz. <laughs> so, so when did you, I assume you found Jordan Peterson before me, which seems to be the way of most things. So uh, maybe I found him. When did I find him? I feel like it, it, actually it was probably from Joe Rogan that I first okay. came across him, that first yep. interview he did. And then I started digging through his uh, lecture videos, um, which was, I don't know, October, November, sometime around the end of last year. Um, yeah, and when I found him, I was just coming out of a, uh, a cult. <laughs> oh. oh, that's yeah. interesting. So I, I've got quite a uh, unintentional history with uh, cults, it seems, which is peculiar because I, I uh, generally am a very like, uh, I don't know what the right word is, individualistic person. I kind of have a lot of faith in my own ability to understand and interpret things. Mm -hmm. And yet I repeatedly find myself... Uh, in situations like this. <laughs> um, but yeah, the uh, that, that was actually the fourth cult technically I had been part of in a vague sense. So that was the first one that I actually chose and, uh, and um, consciously partook in. Whereas the others were kind of like minor, more normal bait and switch type of situation. Okay. Um, you know, I, I had, uh, when I was young, I think 18, maybe I think 19, actually, um, I kind of started looking for alternative lifestyles, particularly within the, man, this headphone has given me some problems. Mm. Um, particularly within the, the kind of green movement and the homesteading movement, so I went about trying to learn how to uh, homestead. And ironically, it seems most people that homestead, or at least are willing to teach it, are actually cults. Uh, good warning that's, for those out there. <laughs> that's interesting. Um, yeah, I, I, you know, I'm, I'm joking there, but uh, yeah. I seem to, to particularly have attracted those types of situations. Um, so yeah, that whole bit of my history started when I, when I, uh, was going through the woofing program, which is worldwide opportunities on organic farms. And so I figured that what it's basically a work trade scenario where farms will put up ad listings and then it's basically you work on the farm for some period of time and a certain number of hours per week and then they give you something in return and it's usually just lodging and uh 
maybe I can do this without this headphone. So, someone who came, he and his wife were on a kind of a cross country trip and then they uh, came to Living Stones one Sunday and they had, they were going to basically swap a little bit of labor for a, a free night stay. Yes. And, and they, they found it a very, we, of course it was only one place that they stopped, but they said, Boy, never again. <laughs> <laughs> that's what I, well, that's, I think the scenario is like, you know, there are definitely just farms that you can find through those types of situations that are just looking for cheap labor. But it's also like the perfect uh, situation for people that are doing more than just farms to, uh, oh. you know, spread their message. Wow. Um. <clears throat> and it didn't help, you know, I was kind of, I was coming out of a very strong teenage atheist phase, like the very classic, um, you know, I've got it all figured out and, you know, it's all material and, and that whole thing. And, you know, around the age of 18, I started realizing like, oh, wait a second, there's a lot of experiences and, uh, you know, there's a lot of stuff that doesn't fit in this worldview that, that I can't you know, process with using it. Or if I do process it, it ends up just being this dull, flat, uh, very unsatisfying way to view. <laughs> uh, you if know, I haven't experienced it. It doesn't exist. Yeah, exactly. Me exactly. and my 18 years on this planet. Oh, oh yeah, yeah. Just saying. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I, I had it all figured out. And I am, you know, I have always had a lot of faith in my own intelligence. Uh, not that sounds oxymoronic, but it is not. <laughs> um, which I've certainly humbled throughout the years now that I think about you know, you can only mess up so many times before you start wondering, like, hmm, maybe there's something uh, a little... Uh, maybe I shouldn't here. be in charge of myself. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> maybe I'm not a good master of my... Mas captain of my own ship. Certainly, certainly. Well, and it's ironic because, yeah, it's, it's a very uh, stark contrast between my kind of again, I kind of default towards that dull, I'm the master mm -hmm. of my own, you know, and then it gets to the points where it's just too much, there's too much built up that I haven't been able to process. And then it kind of bursts out in a big motion. Hence, for instance, at 19, taking off to Hawaii to go work on a random farm and learn, uh, you know, uh, whatever I thought I was going to learn there. So of course I picked an ad that was like meditation and retreat center with organic farming and, and it sounded great and, uh, and all that, all that stuff. And when we got there, it ended up being a group of Harry Krishnas that actually had a, a, a massive uh, network. So, I mean, like certainly a few hundred people were involved and they had, kind of taken over the whole part of the island. Um, this is the, the big island out in Pahoa, which is like the, it's like the Wild West out there. Like hmm. I've been, I, I backpacked through Europe when I was 18 by myself and went and did all that stuff. Nowhere I went in Europe felt as foreign as this area of Hawaii. It's a really bizarre place and it's where the lava flow uh is so basically the problem is that no insurance companies or or utility companies will put anything out there because they're worried that the lava is going to change direction and just wipe it out and they don't want to so the only people that live out there are people that are willing to do so with like minimal utilities and right water catchment is the main way anyone has any water to work with. And, and, uh, and it usually attracts people running from the law because there's just none out there, you know, and then it, it, it's a weird place. It's a really weird place. So that was the base for the Hare Krishnas, which in itself is like, 
and I can kind of get into this, I kind of have a philosophy at this point that everything is actually cults, that the fundamental mode hmm. of, of uh, human society is, is cultic, hmm. right? And that kind of gets yeah. into that. You ask the question, what, what does a cult do for a person? <clears throat> Well, there's the the surface level kind of like uh, it offers community and and you know group adhesion and those types of things, right? I almost think of the word cult as like the particle that makes up culture, right? It's the smaller version that then. That's good. I like that. Um, and so when you ask the question, what's it doing for people? I'd say its main function is to make the world digestible able to be consumed right because without any cultic framework we're just kind of lost in an amorphous experience of life that has no context or or uh, inherent meaning and that's tricky right it it, the exam to actually play with those dynamics all the way just because we're such a social creature you'd have to imagine a person that had no socialization whatsoever and what they're interpreting as as the world, which has actually happened. There's been feral humans and uh, they're, you know, they don't develop in the way they, they're not almost not human in the way that we think of humans. It it diverts back towards something more like a a very smart monkey. (laughs) No offense to the feral humans out there. <laughs> well, there's the feral human cohort of my following that I'll, I'll write them a letter say maybe they should skip this video. The, the feral the feral humans on YouTube. <laughs> but that I, I think that's an awesome observation. That I think that's really helpful. You know, a lot of the, the Jordan Peterson, Sam Harris conversation got into this a priori framework, which yes. you know, part of it is hardware, that, but a lot of it's software. And we're, we're very, you know, we're very mysterious creatures. And for, for being us, we think we'd know ourselves better. And we clearly don't. No, not at all. Not at all. And that's kind of, you know, in the process, what, what's it mean to make the world digestible? Well, it is, it's not necessarily just in the mimetic realm, right? That's, and I think Jordan Peterson has got into this before too, where we've got the memes and then we've got the genes and the relationship between the two of them is not nearly as cut and dry as we would like to perhaps imagine. Right. Um, I think that's very, I think that's very true. Yeah. So, and a lot of it is like, we can't actually get down to our own hardware. And it's almost like we're stuck in a mimetic complex where even the hardware itself is what is producing the, you know, the mimetic framework. And so there's not, there's not a good way that we can actually untie ourselves from any mimetic framework. You know, that even that statement means nothing to a, a human from where we normally operate from. You're, you're always operating within it. You know, the most basic, one of the most basic levels is just language, <laughs> which is, you know, pretty extreme you know, meme. Uh, uh, I can't think of the word. Possession. Right, we we become possessed by language to the point that we we can't operate not using language. And then there's there's religious movements that basically try and allow you to get underneath, you know, the the, the language that our mind is constantly using to interpret everything. And then of course the structure of the language and how we go about it goes on forever. But um, uh, I forgot what my original point with oh. So what is the, oh, another interesting observation is just, you know, when you start kind of, particularly when you get into our (laughs) postmodern context, you know, this kind of post-truth world, and, you know, what does it mean for- I'm still listening. Hang on. I got to get a coffee but (laughs) I can still hear you. My cord is big. Cool. (laughs) Um, What does it mean for a- a, uh, 
Oh, darn. I keep losing my train of thought. I've got all this nervous energy. I'm not used to talking <laughs> like this. But it keeps throwing me off. Um, makes the world digestible. Oh, darn. I forgot where I was going with it. Well, I'll go back to the story and then maybe the, the idea will, will come back around. Um, so, yeah. Show up at the, it, in, on the big island of Hawaii with a, a bag and two guitars. I don't know why I brought two guitars when I didn't have a car or anything. <laughs> so I'm, I'm walking like miles a day to get around the, the area. <laughs> The two, three, oh, it, was, it was a very silly. With two guitars. Situation, yeah, yeah. Very minimalist. Like a, a big Me hard too. case. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> classical and a steel string. It's very. <laughs> do bizarre things when you're 19 and trying to figure out life. Um, <clears throat> so we get there, and of course, we, we find out that it's not just a, a meditation you know, a, a kind of non-religious meditation. It's not non-denominational. <laughs> yes, it's very <laughs> denominational. Um, and we try, you know, it, thankfully two people, I went with a friend of mine and two people showed up the day before we got there that had done the same thing where they just randomly decided to go do this wolfing program at this place. And so the four of us kind of grouped up and one of the guys um, fr from the other group was borrowing his friend's car. So we had some amount of transportation once we had kind of all linked up and, and everything, which made the whole situation a lot better. But you can very easily see how people that, you know, had kind of put everything on the line to get out there in the first place then would become stuck within the system because it's their only means to, you know, have anything to, to, <laughs> to eat or have a place to sleep. Um, and there were certainly people like that there. Mm. Um, so we ended up only sticking around for about two or three weeks. We kept getting into arguments with the, the people and I kind of took, you know, I, I like to go in and deconstruct systems it's fun it's like a game to me and so i was kind of like poking around and and trying to find the inconsistencies and and all that kind of stuff and it it drove them nuts <laughs> and uh <laughs> i love this story this is an awesome story <laughs> it's very just see it <laughs> Very, very strange set of experiences I've, I've had. Um, Not all. I mean, I was a missionary in the Dominican Republic, and we'd have people come down and because they were looking for whatever, and they yeah. would roll. I lived in a little town towards the end of the world, in a sense, and the most interesting people would come and live there. And because if... There were hardly any North Americans living there, so you'd all get to know, you'd all find each other pretty quickly. And yeah, oh, I, I, it was, it was Star just reasons. Yeah, <laughs> yeah you, get, you do, you get the really weird cultures in those places no one else wants to, or not yeah. wants to necessarily, but just no one else goes. Yeah. Um, you know, this spot in Hawaii was probably more along the lines of wants to because of the constant threat of being wiped out by a volcano, but. <laughs> <laughs> very it's like all of the energy uh you know ambient energy was just pushed through the roof there you know you you had like the volcano going off right there the 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 freaking rainforest the jungle was just shooting up out of the ground you had the pacific ocean like you know, there within view at all times. Every, all of the elements were just so big and you could see it like driving people crazy. You know, it was wow. too much. <laughs> wow. Um, yeah, it's a weird place. 
you know. Uh, so eventually, we basically got kicked out of that place. <laughs> and what we did is we rented a shack in the jungle. We were we were staying at a noni farm in an abandoned school bus for for a couple weeks. That's you know we were trying to get away from the home base of the of you know it's Chris McCandless in paradise. Y- yes, yeah, yeah. The into the wild guy, you know, who died <laughs> up there in Alaska. Yes, <laughs> but at least it's warm. Warm. It's a lot harder to die. There's a lot more food too. It just kind of falls. <laughs> falls out of everything um stayed at the noni farm for a while basically trying to separate ourselves from the group to see if we could like still make it work just doing the farming work with less of the (laughs) religious influence um and it's not you know it's not to say like a group of people practicing a religion was the problem. It was a lot more of how they specifically had had it structured, which was extremely dictatorial and like, you know, a hierarchy that was really rigid in its command line. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, but, yeah. So we get out, we end up renting a shack in the jungle with no- nothing. It, no electricity, no running water. There was a water catchment system that we had been using for weeks before we found out it was infested with mosquito larva. So we had just been like brushing our teeth and, and cooking with it, you know. We never drank it straight because uh, it's not safe. You have to heat the water up. But um, We had to sleep in a tent inside the shack because it was <laughs> infested with cockroaches. <laughs> So, <laughs> camping inside the building, <sighs> it was very silly. Uh, during that time, I ended up uh, starting to date the girl that had come with the other dude. They weren't together, but like, so it was three guys, one girl. I got the girl. Oh. And so the other two dudes took off with the car. So... <laughs> And they were, they said they were going hiking for the weekend. And like a week later, we're like, hmm, we still <laughs> haven't heard anything. Two weeks later, they finally sent us a message saying, you know, we're, we're not coming back. <clears throat> and we still have the car. Um, and so at this point, you know, we were about four or five miles away from the town when we were with the Krishnas, but this shack in the jungle, this, and it was owned by one of the main Krishna guys. He owned thousands of acres. He just bought up all of the land no one wanted and then put up all these shitty, no, sorry. Uh, not good structures. <laughs> um, <clears throat> so, Oh, so so you you basically you took the highway out from the town about nine miles, and then you hit a, a sign that just says "end of the road," and it's where the volcano back in the '80s, the lava flow just wiped out an entire city and the highway that took you out there. So then you'd walk across, you know, I don't know, a few hundred yards of lava, and then the, the highway would reappear. And then when you saw a bread tree, which is a distinct fruit, it's like a giant spiky fruit, um, <clears throat> you turned right into the jungle and walked back for about a mile and hoped you found the shack. And that's where we lived. Um, so it was about 10 miles from town and we didn't have a car. And because you're so far out at that end of the road place, no one ever drives out there. So you'd have to walk usually about five or six miles until you were close enough that there was neighborhoods and and traffic so that you could hitch a ride the rest of the way. Um, We stayed there for the remainder of the month and it was just too difficult. We paid $200 to rent it for the month. Um, So we, you know, had to... (laughs) And the dude got money out of you, too. Oh, oh yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Definitely. And then 
we moved to a place called Cinderland. So one of the recruitment strategies the Krishnas had was a food party dance because they would do the kirtan where they are singing and dancing in front of the, the statues and it's a whole production. And then they'd have a giant meal and they would feed whoever would come to the, to the thing. <clears throat> um, and that was every Saturday. So this other place was basically just a hippie commune called Cinderland. They called themselves a um, eco village. And uh, we slept under a tarp, so we didn't have walls anymore, but there also wasn't cockroaches or anything. So it was actually like an upgrade. There's a really big, like giant uh, mesh tarps, not like the tarp you'd get at, you know, uh, Home Depot or, or whatever. Uh, and then you just had a mosquito net over your bed and that was pretty much that, you know, just gravel on the ground. And uh, <clears throat> we stayed there for, for I think, a month and a half. I was there, a to I was on the island for a total of four months. So I kind of forget how the time broke down. But And that was actually a lot more fun. There was nothing productive going on at all. Oh, on Saturdays, to compete with the Krishnas, they'd have a pot pizza party. So they would do all this cannabis cooking and then invite all the hippies to come have a drum circle in the under a tarp. It's a very, very strange place. Oh, wow. Uh, wow. We stayed there for a month. Uh, lots of really weird stories from that place. It's like all of the normal dramas you normally encounter in life, but they're all like times a hundred out there. Yeah. Yep. <clears throat> this yeah. I got my first acupuncture uh there because I helped a dude pay for his groceries. Uh his name was Thunder and my first acupuncture was given to me by Thunder laying on on the ground um on a on a pallet. <laughs> um and that was really intense. He put the needles all the way through my feet in between my the bones of my feet because he said it was like a grounding thing to pull the energy out so that gave me a really negative view of uh, acupuncture <laughs> oh, <laughs> the whole time, like laying there with my eyes closed just trying not to have like a full panic like I couldn't move or stand or anything because I, I had the needles in my feet <laughs> oh just waiting it out don't get acupuncture in the middle of nowhere by a guy named thunder another good piece of advice um if that's not ob obvious <laughs> <laughs> stayed there oh. for a month and a half nine years later so like a year and a half ago or something i'm 29 um there's a guy that was doing a series of like kind of hour long documentaries on various cults that he would find and go explore and see what their system was. Well, Cinderland was one of the ones he went to go explore. So when I was there, I just thought it was an eco village with, you know, it's just a silly hippie place to hang out and, you know, Ends up that's not the case, and that the main guy who was gone when I was there called himself Jesus with a Z, G E Z U S U U S. Um, no relation to Kanye. Yeah, right. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Wondering where Kanye got his inspiration. Um, <laughs> uh, Jesus the Cinderland and he so it ends up the giant tarps we were all sleeping under were actually supposed to be sails for an ark and what had happened is that Jesus had a, a you know a, a revelation a revelation thank you um, that global warming was going to cause the sea levels to rise so dramatically that he was going to build an ark, right? Typical 
Noah's Flood reworking. He was going to build an ark, which uh, uh, 10 years later, nine years later, they were actually doing, like building this wooden contraption out of like palm trees. And, you know, it was about 20 feet long, not quite big enough to restart the world. But um, <clears throat> the tarps we were sleeping under were actually intended to be sails for this ark. And he was going to, when the, the flood happened, sail his ark from the big island of Hawaii to Machu Picchu in South America, which would then be at sea level, and then he would restart humanity with his his uh, his little cult there. He had a plan. See? So that was cult number two. Yes, he definitely had a plan. Plans are good. <laughs> so good for good for Jesus with a Z. <laughs> yes, Jesus with a Z. <laughs> um. Yeah, so that was number two. Granted, when I was there, he wasn't, and it was just a pretty basic little goofy hippie commune. You missed Jesus and just got the disciples. Too bad. Right? (laughs) (laughs) Um, And then number three came about two years later. So the same friend I went to Hawaii with, um, and then, you know, he had split ways and gone with the other guy that had the car, and we hadn't talked for like a year and then we kind of warmed back up to each other and we're hanging out a couple years later. He had a wife now and a daughter once he'd come back. Um, and he remembered a teacher that had given a, a kind of new agey lecture about love and he had this whole system of how it all works and how the religious symbolism works and he found it really interesting. So he contacted this guy and found out that he had a permaculture setup. So we're still trying to learn like, you know, basic (laughs) homesteading skills through this whole experience. Um, And so he sets up to go basically learn permaculture from this guy. Um, And so he goes out there with his wife and his like two year old daughter. Uh, this is Idaho. We were living in the Pacific Northwest, so it wasn't too big of a jump. It was up on the panhandle. Can't remember the name of the town. Man, it's raining. Um, if you can't tell, I seem to have a thing for shack like spaces. <laughs> I can touch the ceiling. Uh, <laughs> I don't see a tent though. It can't be too bad. That's upgrades, right? It's <laughs> the tent's out back. <laughs> um, so we go, we go to this. Uh, he shows up a week before I do. I'm having phone conversations with him, and it's like I can tell something's weird but he won't say what he just is like really wanting me to come like right now, which I don't understand why or like what is. <laughs> so I get there, the old guy and his wife, it ends up, you know, we were there for about a week before we got the whole story or I was ends up. He was a failed cult leader. So at one point, his whole permaculture setup had about 20 people working it. Um, and his whole thing was that he believed that planet Nibiru was going to fly past the earth any year now. So classic doomsday, another interesting quality of cults, actually an interesting quality of culture in general is doomsday. Like the only reason anyone does anything is because of doomsday, the entire green movement is not like let's reconnect with the earth it's we have to or it's going to die like it it always has that undertone which kind of threw me for a long time like why is that such a prevalent notion in seemingly every culture that we encounter and then i started thinking well it's probably us projecting death which is to say no matter what like right life ends in a uh, an apocalypse. That's right. Now it might be a personal one, 
but it's no less we still have to grapple with that that same structure and so we have this way of mythologizing it and then using that to be able to process the experience of death and thus you end up with all cultures in some way having some basis of an apocalyptic you know that's my my guess at least um i think it's a good guess i think it's true <laughs> i often when i teach about the day of the lord in the old testament i mean the day of the lord is a very interesting device because it's the fall, it's the destruction of the temple in Jerusalem, it's a plague of locusts, it's, it's the crucifixion, it's the resurrection, it's, yeah. the, it's judgment day, it's all those things. They're all the day of the Lord. And, and it comes to each one of us personally, it comes to every institution, it comes to every household, it comes to the whole world. I think, I, yeah. I think you're right on. Um, yeah, and that's, yeah. The, the the interesting thing is seeing what people do with it and how they structure it. Yeah. And, and that's a good example is you have so many elements to it within the Christian mythos where you can't almost, you, you can't quite parse it into some simple, uh, a simpler form. It's always, it's got, it's uh, sitting on a paradox in a sense, right? It, which is, that's another part of my cult theories is that one of the main features of a powerful uh, cult is that it has the ability to process a paradox. Mm. Now it process is tricky because it's more like it allows us to experience a paradox rather than like make sense of it with our, our mind, you know, uh, Christ's crucifixion and resurrection or even the figure of Christ at all as God incarnate. Those are central paradoxes that fundamentally don't actually, they don't make sense to our conscious mind, but they hit some perceptual system underneath it, right? They change the way that we are actually experiencing life or they, sh that's ideally its function. Um, and, you know, cults that can't deal with paradoxes usually are very short short term and part of that too is that when you can process a single paradox it kind of gives you a a um like a lens that you can use then to interpret all incoming information and that's really necessary because if you don't have something like that your cognitive dissonance starts to build right as new experience is coming in it it can't transfer over into a processed bit of your network fast enough and we start feeling dissonance mm -hmm. when that dissonance peaks a threshold the person will jump cults they'll go find another interpretation that mm -hmm. reduces the cognitive dissonance back below their threshold mm -hmm. so if you're looking at really powerful interpretive systems <clears throat> They generally need some way to be able, I would actually say it's their, 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 uh, probably their most useful, or, or I can't think of the word, their base function is being able to actively interpret life as it is happening, mm -hmm. you know. And I would argue that's like what religion is also trying to get us to do, right? We, we go back to these old stories and make sense of them and figure out all these these hidden intricacies hiding in the stories and all of this is kind of building up a skill set so that we can symbolically interpret life as it's happening mm -hmm. right mm -hmm. so i think we end up in in issues when we either stick too strongly to the past which is like we we don't see it as a skill we see it as a isolated truth locked at some point in history mm -hmm. rather than as a a truth that can be experienced, you know, actively within our, our own mm -hmm. uh, um, experience. I think that's really good. It's really helpful. Uh, maybe. <laughs> no, uh, no, I think there's a lot there that's really true because we do no need, we do need, because I mean, you're exactly right. I mean, the world is, is just, too, it's it's manifestly complex that we can't process it, and so and, and part of that is paradox. And in fact, that's what 
you know, you might think of religions kind of like enzymes and they help break these down. Now they don't explain them away, but they do allow you to hold them. At least no, it they- It allows you to, to actually add it to yourself and then change your expression through the, you know, it's- Yes. It's, the, the analogy to consumption is like a, a really good one. You know, yeah. You can't do anything with an apple. Right. Until you, you break it into pieces and then that, that process of breaking it down and synthesizing it with your body is what produces the energy needed to actually do all this stuff. Right. Part, uh, part of the reason we can't process most leaves is that we have a friend who's a biochemical engineer in Iowa and he says, well, we, we lack this enzyme. And yeah. so, you know, one of the things he was working on is creating biofuel. And so he uses these enzymes and breaks things down. And interesting. And I think I think you're right. Cult, religion, they break they break this stuff down and into a productive package that we can actually use. Um, to use. That's right. Yeah. No, I think that's a I think it's a terrifically helpful observation. I really appreciate that. And and the other part of that too. Uh, this is the old thought that I forgot a while back. Now <laughs> is. We, we kind of are at the point, right? This this postmodern frame that we imagine as being, well, post, like current. Yep. I don't think it's actually current. I think it's what happens any time two cultures try and synthesize. Now, we can synthesize cultures. It's just that normally the consumption rate is really slow. So, for example, you know... Uh, the spread of Rome, right? A large part of its collapse was this inability to hold all of these cultures within a single framework where it tried to synthesize too much, right? It's trying to eat an elephant in one bite. Right. It's like you can't do, you have to cut it up into the pieces. Right. And then, you know, you might be able to eat an elephant, but you certainly won't be able to do it all at once. Right. Um, <coughs> so the trick with the modern, it will, the current age is just that that effect <clears throat> is overpowering. We can't escape it because we're for every event, you see a thousand opinions around it right. that are all a specific cultural lens. And we don't know how to synthesize all of those viewpoints at once. So what we end up having to do is isolate our, our ability to do so into a pretty tight, cultic bubble <coughs> and then that's the other interesting bit is that we know this is the that we're living in a cultic world because whoever we look at that's not in our cult we think they're in a cult right? <laughs> like it seems silly to not take that one step further and go oh wait i'm probably also Part I'm of in a cult. <laughs> yeah, but we, we defend ourselves from it from this idea of some objective truth. And that's what the concept of objective truth has traditionally right. done. Right. You know, it, it, objective is a bit. You, you have what I call the monarchical vision. You have the monarchical yes. vision. You see the world clearly. Um, and, and so in a, lot of, in a lot of ways, people who say deconverted from Christianity they, they would use metaphors like I, I was stepping out of the room into the bright light of day. I yeah. mean, that's, that's kind of a way to represent, you know, now I see. Clearly. I see, yeah. Now I see. I see the cult I was in, whereas right. before I just thought it was the world. Right. Without <laughs> recognizing that uh, you're still in a world. Yes. And yeah, but yeah. you don't. You, you have no you culture. Get out of you them. No you're in, it's like a Russian doll problem. You right, know? right, right. Break one open, you're just in another. Um, and I think that's actually like a main part of this whole thing is like instead of trying to always escape our cults, that granted it does have some use, right? Science is kind of like the, that's its whole thing is the cult breaker. And then right, ironically right. it ends up recreating the same thing in the process of trying to escape it. right. Um. Oh, <laughs> no, that's, that's really good. And, you know, because one of the things, you know, I hope to talk to James Lindsay, who's part of the Bogosian Lindsley Pluckrose trio who wrote the hoax papers. 
and, oh, yeah. and Peter Bogosian was a big, he wrote a manual for creating atheists. And so they've been, he's been big into this, you know, science and what do they discover? But, oh my goodness, there's my a religion out there. Is, yeah. It's getting surprised. I, I'm shocked. There's yeah. a religion shocked. Have you? Oh, here's my winnings. Um, you know, <laughs> yeah, but all life is religion. I mean, it's, it's, I, oh, I think you're really helpful. This is really good. And, uh, so I guess the final part of this is like, instead of trying to escape the cults or make one seem like the real one and the rest are just deluded people. It makes more sense to embrace that aspect. And then from there going, go forward through a pragmatic game. Hmm. Right. So they're not all created equal. Some cults have the ability to process much better and much more meaningfully than others. Yep. Yep. And so I, and I, I, this, it it gets big, but I think this is inevitably where humanity must go because of our modes of production, right? So you have the, you have the tangible age, which is most human history, you know, up until the, the peak of the tangible age happens at the industrial revolution. And then we enter into the intangible age, the age of, thought and ideas. And, and right now, America's economy is mostly based off of the production of intangible goods. Hmm. Um, interestingly, you also see a major shift in how we symbolize value in the world with that as well, right? Whole, all of human history up until the intangible age, money is represented by a physical good, a precious metal usually, but yeah. also beads or shells or right? Some limited resource that you can hand to somebody else. Um, With the intangible age, that system could not function because thoughts move way faster than physical objects, Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. right? So we, that's when you see the rise of fiat uh, currencies suddenly Mm -hmm. pop up. And what is a fiat currency? Well, it's functioning in this intangible realm. It's not tied to anything in the actual world. It's largely functioning on, on belief. Fiat mm-hmm. itself means, I think, an arbitrary order. Yeah. So you're just, right? Yeah. <laughs> um, I think that we will see a third age coming, which would be, you know, the untangible mm. age. And that this untangible is not dealing in the realm of ideas, but in the underlying structure that produce that ideas come out of, Hmm. which is that cultic structure. Right. And I think that the intangible age will peak at the development of AI, which will leave humans very little room to go anywhere else to have something to trade in. Hmm. I think that can be symbolized in a, in a number of ways. One might call it like trading in our, our experience of being alive mm-hmm. rather than necessarily our interpretation of it. Although it all is tied together, you know, you can't divorce the, the realms. And I think we are already seeing this. I think that's what social media is. And right, the, even the concept of celebrity is changing from someone who's good at something to someone who just enjoys being alive, right? Mm -hmm. We follow them just because we want to see their experience of life itself, not because they're the smartest or they're the the fast or whatever. We participate in their experience of being alive. Yes, yes, exactly. Right now, there's no value structure for that. And so what we're doing is we're backwards translating it into the tangible. So we, the only way it becomes valued is by selling ad space. I think once we make the jump to actually valuing it itself, we'll see this automatic, uh, pragmatic game of cults arise, and it will be actually uh, 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 exposed to 
Jeez. Ex- my roommate's coughing. I don't know if you can pick that up. No, I, can, I don't hear him. Okay. <laughs> um, exposed to, to economic pressures, right? Open market pressures. And I think that that's actually a really good thing particularly when we don't have our hierarchy inverted where the untangible or right other th- the soul right that part of life that doesn't you, you can't quite capture other than by being alive mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. um <clears throat> yeah i think that we will that direct market pressures will will create a system that is really very good for people oh and when it's not in service to the tangible i think that's what's making it so gross at the moment Hmm. this kind of hidden manipulation in how the whole system is functioning that we're not aware of Mm -hmm. um but we'll see you know it could also go the other way and be terrible or it could turn into some type of like you know the government is the the truth right all the classic yeah. cultic yeah. Yeah. things that pop up when the ground gets a little yeah mushy. yeah and this is yeah. this connects again to peterson because that's a large part of his argument is like christianity isn't where it's at because of manipulations of power systems it's right. where it's at because it's one of the best games right. around right right so it it, yeah i think it can only do good to have these things kind of compete in a in an open in a marketplace yeah you know fundamental i mean they always kind of have it's just we haven't actually valued it or stuck value judgments on it and and part of what i was just talking to a an, an orthodox father a little bit earlier this morning and you know one of the thing interesting things is how the American context changes the Orthodox Church because the Orthodox Church comes from the old world, state established churches. The, the crazy thing about America with its, with its religious freedom is that there is very much a market. Yes, definitely. And, and that, you know, in terms of Christianity, pro, that happened to Protestantism and just whoosh. And then you get, you know, the 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 mormons the jehovah's yeah. witnesses i mean and it just it just flies and you see the same thing with with eastern with buddhism with hinduism they, yes. they kind of become new age which is highly market oriented yes. to, to the to the point of you know harry krishna cult is yes. is ex- extremely market oriented yes and Absolutely. they learn they learn to use the market in strange new ways yeah so Boy, I, I, gosh, I wish we had more time, but I, yeah. <laughs> so, but this, this was, this was so cool. This was so cool. <laughs> well, and I really hope you, you're able to make it down to, to San Jose to the meetup because absolutely because a, a bunch of the guys who will come down with me to the meetup, they're going to watch this. They're going to want to meet you. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. Excellent. Yeah, I will definitely make it over. It's, it's, uh, I remember or in the email exchange, you said that, and I was like really excited because I've been wanting to make it to one of the Sacramento, Sacramento ones for a while now. And it just, I haven't been able to get like, it's the drive back that makes me like not. <laughs> well, I've been, cause again, my son goes to UC Santa Cruz. So I know that drive Yeah, and yeah, you know, it's, it's a drive. It's a drive up over the it's mountain and, um, but, uh, but we're, we're, we're actually not too far from the Santa Cruz, you know, that we're in that in San Jose, quite close to. I know you're right on. I looked at the location. Yeah. You're right on the other side of the 17 there. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Basically Los Gatos. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. It's perfect. Yeah. <laughs> well, boy, I, I sure be, do. I have permission to post this because this has been. This yeah. Yeah, been, absolutely. It's just been ecstatic. I mean, I, <laughs> the stories and the ideas, <laughs> this is, this has been, you know, the sum Sorry, of all. It's, it's like a shotgun shot trying to get it out. Normally I'm a little uh, more organized, but no, it was perfect. People. There was narrative and the, and you know, as, as someone who say <laughs> critique sermons and helps people craft things, this, 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 this fell together really nicely. So awesome. <laughs> so I'll, I'll probably post this one today. So, cool. <laughs> well, it's great to meet you, Nick. 
Absolutely. It's great to finally talk to you. I've watched so many hours of your content. It's really interesting to actually interact. I, I feel like I'm, uh, yeah, there's some weird meta layer going on here. Yeah, well, I think, I think you've colonized, I think some of your ideas have colonized in me and they're going to keep <laughs> working. And so if you start hearing some of your ideas come out there, don't sue me. Uh, I stole them all, so... <laughs> <laughs> well, I did too. So we're all a bunch of thieves. <laughs> well, great talking to you, Nick. And, and again, I hope to see you on the 22nd. Awesome. Sounds good. Great okay. To talk to you too. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.